Uh, there's a Japanese art, uh, ancient art form called kitsugi. I was probably pronounced it wrong. And in kitsugi, they take pottery that was broken and they bring it back together. They, they reassemble the pottery with gold. And they take all the pieces and put the pottery back together. And the belief is that the uh, pottery that was repaired is more valuable than the original. <laughs> Satan has done an amazing job at splitting us apart. And by the way, Satan's the enemy. Not the white man, not the black man, not the poor, not the immigrant. Satan's the enemy. Can I get amen? And Satan has done a great job of, bringing, of, of dividing us through different kinds of racism, personally mediated racism, one to another. White, black, Hispanic, Asian. It's not a white, black thing only. It's all of us all around the world globally as well. Internalized racism where people start to internalize the message that they have been told. There are people who have been told that they're less than and now believe it. And they hate themselves and their own culture. Internalized racism, you might not have heard of that. And then there's institutional racism. There's systems designed to keep people in place. The devil has done an amazing job of splitting us apart. But God, <laughs> God, God, Jesus has this thing about bringing broken pieces together. Can I get amen? amen? He has this thing about making things that were ugly, beautiful, broken, fixed. And he can't do it and won't do it except through us. We are his vehicle. It has to be us, but we have to do something different. We have to move past the optics of diversity. You can have lots of colors and, and nationalities in your church and in your house, but they're not in your heart. <laughs> they could be in your room, but they're not, you don't have a ministry. You can have a diverse crowd, but not a diverse ministry. So we want to move past churches ministering to neighborhoods where they feel comfortable and all the neighborhoods that God has given them. Don't drive around. I had, a, I had a prayer meeting in San Diego years ago, and, and, and uh, it, I intentionally put it in the black community, and I had pastors driving there, and they said, we've never been to this part of the town. I said, so you're telling me you fly to Africa to minister to poor black people, but you won't go 10 minutes right down the street. Amen. We have to get past where God says, I'm going to call you to go wherever. And by the way, if you're a black church in the black community, are you going to the Hispanic community right down the street? Uh, if you're a Hispanic, are you going to the black church? It's all of us. Can I get amen? It's all of us. So we got to move past it. Let me give you some context of who I am and where I get this from. I have uh, two black uh, grandfathers from Jamaica. All my grandparents from Jamaica. I'm not going to do this, though. <laughs> I got 40 jobs, brother, 40 jobs. All right? and, and I got uh, <laughs> two, 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 both my grandmothers, all my grandparents grew up in Jamaica. One grandmother was half Chinese, half black. The other grandmother was white. Her parents sent her from Jamaica with Cindy's. They didn't want her to marry a black Jamaican, so they sent her to Jamaica, New York, where she met a black Jamaican. <laughs> I grew up in a black neighborhood, went to school in a white neighborhood. Because of this tan color, I was too dark for the white people, so I got called all those names. I was too light for the black people, so I got called all those names. So that's why I'm learning Spanish. <laughs> And I am learning Spanish. I'm going to preach my first Spanish sermon on the 6th of May. My church is also as diverse as San Diego. My church is also diverse as San Diego. We are leaning into this. Two years ago, there was a shooting in San Diego. An uh, immigrant from Uganda was shot by a police officer. It was filmed. It was put on TV. For a week, our city did this. And for a week, the devil said, you have to pick one of each, each side. You have to be against the police or for the police, for the black community, against the black community. The devil gave you two options. In every race conversation, the devil's only going to give you two options. And in those two options, he's going to say, you're, you're going to be on one side against the other, fighting the other, and you have to pick. There's a third option. <laughs> and that's what the book is about. There's a third option. In Joshua, and I'll read this real quick. In Joshua chapter 5, Joshua was leading the Jews into the promised land. It says in verse 13, It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes up and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword. And Joshua said to him, Are you for us or our adversaries? Angel, you have to pick a side. Are you on our side or this side? Angel said, uh -uh, Homie, don't do that. I, I don't pick sides. I am the side. <laughs> So he said, he said, he said, are you for us and them? He said, no. He said, no, no, I didn't ask you that. Are you for us? And he said, no. He said, if you bow down, I'm not going to read the whole thing. You bow down and worship. The only way you're going to get into the promised land, if you honor and worship the presence of God in your midst. This is not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about God. Can I get amen? And so I want to talk to you about that because the third option is that we look at every single one of us. And by the way, save or not save people. People you don't like, people you have nothing in common with every single person. What do we have 
100% in common. By the way, we're all 99.5% genetically the same. I'm not even talking about that. White, black, Asian, rich, poor, you're 99.9% genetically exactly the same. But you are 100% the same in that God has given the same image to every single one of us. Amen. And the image of God has the responsibility to acknowledge itself in other people. The image of God has the ability to acknowledge itself in other people. The image of God has the ability to walk with God, love with God, like God, forgive like God, encourage like God, speak like God. We, we do God a disservice when we are racist or when we look down on people because we are looking at the image of God and someone else saying, your image is inferior to my image when that's not biblical at all. That every single image is the same value because God can't, God can't look down on himself. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and he's the same there, 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 and every single one of us. And so I want to talk about how we got divided. Here's what I'm going to talk about. How we got divided and then how we can apply the third option to bring us back together. Sociologists call it, uh, call our division uh, grouping. In group, out group. Uh, Grouping is the way we sort people into either like me or not like me. This is a group. Christians, ministers, senior pastors is a group. Uh, uh, Mega church senior pastors is another group. Women are a group. Men are a group. Youth pastors are a group. We're all part of many groups. Football is a group. And when you are in part of a group, you are intimately involved and intimately knowledgeable about your group. Okay? If you're a senior pastor, you know senior pastor issues. If you're, if you're assistant pastor, you know assistant pastor issues. And so you, whatever group you're in, you understand uh, the intimacies of that group. Whatever group you're not in, that's called your out group. You don't know intimate information about that. That's why we make ignorant statements about people we don't know about. We, we, we say those people because we don't know and we're ignorant, so we shouldn't say anything. But, but that's the out group. But your in group, you know all the intricacies of your in group. There's a thing called in group bias. In group bias is your tendency to give preferential treatment to the people of your in group. I want you to think with me right now. And by the way, uh, uh, take this personal, but don't take it personal. Are you, do you follow what I'm saying? Let the Spirit of God minister to you. We've got to think. We've got to get past this. In-group bias is when you look at people who are like you, whether it be pro- by profession, by race, by look, and you give them preferential treatment. I'm going to give you a list of some things. They're going to go on the screen. I am more comfortable with those like me. I am more inclined to spend time socially with those like me. I am more patient with those like me. I give the benefit of the doubt quicker to those like me. I express more grace given when mistakes are made to those like me. It is easier to communicate with those like me. I assume I will get along easier with those like me. I am more willing to get out of, I go out of my way to help those like me. I possess more positive assumptions about those like me. Say a minute, that makes sense. Hey, we're in Alabama. You got people coming. A guy walks in the room. Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, I play for the, uh, for the football team. Oh, you all of a sudden be part of my in-group. I'm going to give you grace. Come on in. How can I give it? See, hey, date my daughter. Whatever you want to do, everything's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all do that in Alabama? Y'all good. Out-group is the opposite. There's out-group discrimination. Out-group discrimination is withholding in-group bias against people. Why? Because they're not part of your group. I am less comfortable with those not like me. I am less inclined to spend time socially with those not like me. I am less patient with those not like me. I give, the, I, I give the benefit of doubt slower to those not like me. I express less grace when mistakes are made by those not like me. It is more difficult to communicate with those not like me. I don't assume you will get along, I will get along with those not like me. I am less willing to go out of my way to help those not like me. I possess less positive assumptions about those like me. Listen, people say, well, I'm a racist, so I'm not a racist. You only got two choices. Here's your third choice. Your third choice is you're human, and you can work better at being unbiased. But you can say, you know what, maybe I do give a little preferential treatment to people who look like me better than people who don't because I feel more comfortable with them. That's fine. You may not have a, have a white sheet or whatever, or whatever form of racism your people, whatever your people are, express, all of us. But the outgrowth is if I walk into a room and someone's going to give me less patience and less grace, I don't care what you call it, it ain't good. <laughs> I, I don't... <laughs> I had a lady come up to me, she said, and this, is, this story is in the book. I had a lady come to me, she said, she, said, um, she said, why can't you just get over it? I said, 
I said, here's what I want you to do. And I, and I created this thing called um, the uh, Walk in My Shoes field trip. <laughs> I said, this is a white lady. I said, and she's a dear friend. I love, love her to death. She speaks. God speaks to her through me. Okay. You can not know these things and be a very nice person. But then you need to learn. <laughs> I said, why don't you go to a place where you are the only white person? Just for 10 minutes. Just try it. She's like, well, well, well. She did it. She did it. She did it. And I had, I had all these questions I want you to ask. I said, I want you to tell me how you felt when I asked you, how you felt when you were driving there, how you felt when you were there, how did people treat you, did, 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 did what you fear happen, did it happen, da, 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 da. And, and I wrote all this stuff down. And she went, I asked, I asked six people, by the way, and two of them said no. And one guy went on 10 minutes while he wouldn't go and actually, and actually had him write a paragraph to put in the book to tell why he didn't want. He said, you know, if I, if I went to a black church, I would feel uncomfortable like I had to leave right away. That breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. And when, when, when people say, can't you get over it, I'm like, you have been living amidst your in-group. You flow in your in-group all day and night. You are getting preferential treatment over the out-group all day and night. So you don't understand what it means to have that not like me all, all, every day. I want you to flip the script in this room. Most of the people in this room are white. I want you to flip it. I want you to make sure, make, make believe that all the people who are in this room that are white are not white. And then all the people who are not white are white. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? And I wonder how many of you white people would come here. I wonder if you would have registered to come. He said, that, that's not my crowd. Why? We're here. We're, we're, we're walking in the midst of our group. <laughs> Are y'all following what I'm saying? That, that you, have to, you have to in your mind, uh, you have to in your mind think, why, what, how does that make me feel? Why does it make me feel that way? Because that's where God can work. Does that make you a racist? Absolutely not necessarily. It just means, hey, I got, that's something I can learn. You can go today and go someplace and say, listen, and don't think, don't go automatically to, I got to go to danger zone. <laughs> God put his image in all kinds of shades and they're wonderful people. And, and because it's an out group, you may only have anecdotal information. And so you generalize and you see stuff on TV and someone told you this, but you have no personal experience. That's where relationship, <laughs> Pastor Chris talked about touch. Hey, I'll be right here after. Come touch me. <laughs> Come touch me. <laughs> in in, 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 in um, uh, Stephen Jones, Dr. Stephen Jones in San Diego, he wrote this article called The Right Hand of Privilege. This country was designed for right-handed people. Literally, most people are right-handed. I'm left-handed. So because I'm left-handed, I got to go to, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Who's left-handed? Amen? Amen? Okay, so, so you can't just go get golf clubs <laughs> at any place. You got to go to an go extra store. You gotta, can't get, get a mint. When you're at school, it's right-handed desk. And you're like this. Are you following me? So you, you got you to gotta go through extra steps. I want you to imagine if you're in group, just because made a right-handed culture. But you're left-handed. So you have to live in a right-handed culture. It's not, it's not the same. And so you're walking in a right-handed culture, and because you're right-handed, everything, what's the problem? All the right-handed people go, I don't see the problem, I don't see the problem. Everything fits, I, get, I can buy everything. I, I, I don't know why. What are you talking about? What are you, what are you worried about? <laughs> and then someone comes left hand and says, I, I, I can't use that desk. I can't, I can't use that glove. I can't use those gloves. I can't, I can't find a store. I got to go on Amazon and order. Well, come here, God, it's too far. Four things I want to give you. Just to respect time, four things. Four things I want you to do. It, it, please put these down, write these down. Rename everybody you see as your brother and your sister. Why? Oh, oh. Listen, look, look what it says in, in, in Matthew chapter, the guy hit me with this. Matthew chapter 22, 37. You shall love your Lord the God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Everyone say neighbor. 1 John 4.20, if someone says I love God and hates his brother, say brother, brother. say sister. sister. If you say you're a liar, for he does not, how does he not love his brother, sister? Say brother, sister. Brother, sister. Whom he has seen, but he can't, how can he love God who he has not seen? Now, the Bible says clearly you have to love your neighbor, your brother, as yourself. Can I get an amen? amen? 
Number one commandment, if you can't do that, everything else is nullified. But what if they're not your brother? What if you rename them? Oh, wow. Oh, they're not like you. They're not, on, they're not like you. They're down here. When I used to watch, it, when I used to watch uh, Cowboys and Indian movies, they always called the Indians savages. They weren't people. They were down here. Blacks were called animals. Down here, I mean, when they had the thing in Charlottesville, they were saying that. Down here. So if you're not, if you call someone an N-word or a white privilege <laughs> or an illegal or an Arab or whatever you call people, as soon as you do that, you give yourself permission not to love them. Oh, that's right. Because you just changed the identification. So therefore, I, I need to be your brother. Because the devil is the enemy, not me. And if you're my brother, and the devil's your, you're not my enemy, the devil is your enemy. Can I get an amen? Number two. Number two. Number two. Give in-group love to your out-group. Next time you're around people who don't look like you, and by the way, this applies to all kinds of stuff. It's just the Bible. Next time, all guys, <laughs> next time you're in a place and you see someone that's not like you, and by the way, they may be the only one not like you in the whole room, think about the illustration about the ARC conference. If you were the only white person in this room. They had two guys arrested in Starbucks here. I'm sure you saw it. I don't need to go into the whole thing, but the next time you go to Starbucks, listen, I don't know about Starbucks, the lady who called the cops. The owner came down. He spent three days. God bless that dude for coming down and did the Philly and deal with it. God bless him. He got caught in the middle. He's now taking the brunt from some lady who called the cops because two brothers are sitting there waiting for a dude. Right? Next time you're in a situation, whatever the situation is, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, you may be the majority, minority and there's a one white person, one Hispanic person. Give them the same grace that you give your people. Wow. Think about that. Number three. <laughs> See my color. Stop saying you don't see color. <laughs> hey, hey, when you go out and get a tan, I go to Hawaii every year, I get a tan. Yes, we tan. I get a tan in Hawaii, and it looks really good. I go to tan, and, and I want you ladies, you get a tan, you're dating a guy, you want to date a guy, you get a tan, and you come to work, you spend five days in Hawaii getting your brown on, and then you come with your little spaghetti strap, and you're walking around work saying, see my brown, see my brown. And for five days, the dude you're trying to get attention to says nothing about your tan. And you're like, is there, do you not see my tan? And he says to you, I don't see color. <laughs> that ain't happening. <laughs> When you get a tan in Hawaii, it's beautiful. When you get a tan in the womb, it's criminalized. <laughs> when you get a tan in the womb, it's scary. It's inferior. I am not saying that all y'all think that. I'm saying this is the difference. When you say you don't see color, you are nullifying not only the color, but the burden that comes with the color. You're, you're nullifying the experience of being in the out group. And so if you, if you say, and when, people, when the first people said it to me, they said, I don't see your color. I was like, I, I really thought they didn't see red, green, brown. I was like, this, that's so sad. Everything's gray. I, I, I don't get it. I didn't understand. And they were like, no, 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 no. I, I don't see your color. And I was like, well, well, how do you know even to say that to me if you don't see it? <laughs> so I, I'm I'm confused. So then I said, well, what color am I? I mean, am I, did you make me like you? I want to be like me. And I want you to be like you. I was watching Sanford the Sun. Sanford the Sun. <laughs> Y'all know Sanford the Sun? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> How many of y'all don't know Sanford the Sun? You're probably young. You don't know Sanford. Okay, Sanford the Sun, I want you. How, I don't know how you could be old. 30 years old, not know who Fred G. Fred G. Sanford is. <laughs> Fred G. Sanford. I just want you to, oh, okay. So Red Fox was a comedian, African American comedian, and he was raunchy, and he was he was just hilarious. But he had a show that was on TV, so it was relatively clean, and he was a junk man in South Central Los Angeles. And there were two cops that always came to the house. One cop was black, one cop was white, and and, and the black cop had to always interpret to the white cop what Fred was saying. 
It's hilarious. It's great. It's hilarious. And the white cop was very formal, and he would talk straight, and, and he would say, uh, so someone robbed Fred G. San Sanford's house. And he said, um, uh, Fred, Mr. Sanford, was the perpetrator colored? And he goes, yeah, he was colored white. <laughs> the devil says you have two options, white people and people of color. God says, no, no, no. I made all y'all colored. Yes, sir. And I made all y'all colored to be beautiful. Everyone say, I am beautiful. I'm beautiful. End of story. Wow. You white people are beautiful. You black people are beautiful. You brown people are beautiful. Everyone's beautiful. That's it. Yeah. Fourthly, give me your heart. And that when I say me, let's give each other our heart. Um, Rod Carew is a Panamanian baseball player. He's older, so a lot of y'all might not know him, but um, he was Panamanian. If you saw him on the street, you'd think he was black, so he was black Panamanian. He had a 328 batting average, 3,000 hits, 18-time All-Star, Rookie of the Year. He was the man. He was the man. And I grew up on Rod Carew. Uh, when he was 71, he had a heart attack, and he needed a heart and a kidney. At the time, there was a 27-year-old white tight end, NFL, played at Stanford, uh, named Conrad. And Conrad had, went into a coma. And Conrad, in the coma, his mother put her, her head on his chest, says, baby, you're going to get up one day, I'm going to hear your heart again. Well, Conrad died. And right before Conrad died, he gave his body, his organs to be donated. And Rod Carew got his heart. So Rod Crew calls Conrad's mother. Conrad's mother calls Rod Carew. You have my son's heart. Rod Carew says, do you want to come listen to your son's heart? He goes over the house. And she puts her chest on Rod Carew's chest. Here's her son's heart again. When Conrad was 11 years old, he met Rod Carew. And he came home and said, Mom, I'm going to be a professional athlete because I met my hero. How is it that a white man's heart can be in a Panamanian black man if we're so different? That's not. I'm going to end with the story. Let me end with the story. There was a guy who was hunting in the woods, and he saw this monster coming at him. And the monster was 100 yards away, and he was trying to get a good shot. And it kept getting closer and closer. It was behind a tree. It was behind a rock. It was behind a tree. It was behind a rock. And he said, I can't. This thing's going to kill me. I got to shoot it. I got to shoot it. And next thing you know, the monster was right here. And then he realized it wasn't a monster. It was his brother. There's no monsters in here. There are people who do bad things. And by the way, they look all kinds of shades. Okay? But we're not monsters. And when I say we, we God made us in his image so we can honor him, glorify him, love like him, encourage like him, speak life like him yeah. into himself and other people. Yeah. And if we can understand and realize and see each other as his brothers and sisters and that we are all one family, then God can bring this broken, fractured nation back together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. We honor you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Mm. 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 God bless you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all sell out. Y'all sell out. <laughs>